Our gospel lesson today comes from the 12th chapter of Matthew. After Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, the Pharisees called a meeting to plot how to kill Jesus. But Jesus knew what they were planning, so he left the area, and many people followed him. He healed all the sick among them, but he warned them not to reveal who he was. This fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah concerning him. Look, my servant whom I have chosen, he is my beloved who pleases me. I will put my spirit upon him and he will proclaim justice to the nations. He will not fight or shout or raise his voice in public. He will not crush the weakest reed or put out a flickering candle. Finally, he will cause justice to be victorious and his name will be the hope of all the world. This is the gospel of the Lord. We're going to get pretty heavy today as we're, we're working through the prophecies here of Jesus. And, and we're going to get pretty heavy here in this final prophecy as what Lois read from Isaiah 42. So I thought I'd start out just a little, a little bit on a lighter note. And, and so we start with a Peanuts cartoon. There's Peppermint Patty. Uh, she's raised her hand. I know the answer. I know the answer. The answer is 12. It isn't? 16? 9? 42? 1? How would it be if I just spelled Mississippi? <laughs> <sighs> Poor Peppermint Patty. Um, and, and, but here's the point I had. If you ask the wrong question, you'll be wrong even if you answered it correctly. All the answers Peppermint Patty were right, they just were right for the wrong questions. Uh, and and, I, and I've mentioned this before, that this is one of our primary things when we read the Bible. We have to know what questions to ask. Questions, I used to always think it was kind of silly when people would say the question's more important than the answer, but it really is, because if you ask the wrong question, you'll get the wrong answer, no matter what, you're, if you get it right. In fact, actually, then the only way you can get it right is if you get it wrong and you accidentally get it wrong for the right thing. <laughs> so, yeah. So our question today is, who is this servant? The servant that the Lord is delighted in. Who, who is that? That's the question we have to answer. Now, of course, I hope you all know the answer is Jesus. But that would really not only be boring if I just said that and sat down now, but we wouldn't learn anything. <clears throat> and so we've got to learn about how do we identify uh, this servant uh, that Israel is talking about. Now, one of the questions... I get asked the most. In fact, it, I was first time I was here standing right there when you were all, we had the potluck and you came back and you're asking me questions. One of the questions was, which version of the Bible do you like the best? And I get to ask that one all the time because there are so many different ones out there. And I remember my answer was, if I was good enough at the original languages, that's all I'd use. Would be, but I'm still working on it. Um, but it was, it was, the same in Jesus' day, too. There were actually more than... They didn't have necessarily translations back there. They had this right here. This is a copy uh, or a, a picture of the scroll of Isaiah that was found in a place called Qumran. This is one of, if you've heard of the Dead Sea Scrolls, this is a picture of one of the Dead Sea Scrolls, which, which I got to go and see this place in Qumran where this was when I was in, in Israel. And they found them by accident. Back now, it's a, a generation or two ago, there was a shepherd boy out and he was bored and he was throwing rocks up into a cave up in the side of a cliff and he heard something break. So he climbed up there and he found this cave was full of clay pots and in these clay pots were these scrolls. And, and this is one of those scrolls. It is actually the oldest complete scroll of Isaiah in existence. This, people were reading this very scroll during Jesus' lifetime. That's, that's how old it is. It's the oldest one in existence. Um, and so they had the Hebrew, but most people didn't know Hebrew at the time of Jesus or just uh, knew some. They didn't know a, lo a lot. The, the, the language, the most common language in the day of Jesus was Greek. Greek in those days was like English today. You go anywhere in the world, you can find somebody who speaks English. Um, that was Greek in those days. So about 200 years before Jesus lived, they translated the scriptures from the Hebrew into the Greek. And that's called, um, I've got just a little thing here, that's called the Septuagint. 
And that was the most common Bible at the time of Jesus, was this Greek Bible. And in fact, when I just read from Matthew, um, if you sat down and, and looked at, at what Lois read out of Isaiah and what Matthew quotes, it's slightly different. We're going to look at the difference in just a second because Matthew is quoting from the Septuagint, the, the Greek version. There is also something that was called the Targum. The Targum was written in Aramaic, which was the language Jesus and other people spoke in those days. Very similar to Hebrew, but they had some differences. Um, and the Targum was considered more of kind of a, a, a commentary or a paraphrase than a translation because people would stick things in. They'd kind of stick notes in to help explain things. Um, if any of you are familiar with, say, like Eugene Peterson's paraphrase of the Bible called The Message, it's, it would be more along the lines of that because he kind of sticks in stuff to try and help it explain it as we go. Um, and, and so uh, I was going to, just a couple examples here from verse 3 of this Isaiah 42. The, the, the Hebrew, if we put it in English, says, He will not break a broken reed and he will not extinguish a dim wick. He will bring justice forth in faithfulness. But now this tar, tar, uh, the Targum, the, the, the Aramaic, it sticks a little bit extra in there to help us understand what it was. And this was very popular in the time of Jesus. People would have these in their homes and read them. It says, The meek who are like a bruised reed, he shall not break. And the poor who are as a glimmering wick with him, he will not quench. He will bring forth judgment unto truth. Now I highlighted what, the, what they stuck in there. The meek and the poor. Does that ring any bells with anybody? What a... The Beatitudes. That's the Beat. That's what we see here. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. When Jesus was preaching the Beatitudes, he's not making this stuff up. He's using language and phrases that the people will recognize that they're already using. What Jesus is doing is bringing them into the context of himself. So that so the people the people they understand. Oh yeah, that's that's in that. It's in that Aramaic version of Isaiah I have at home. It talks about this, about the, about the meek and the poor. And, and so Jesus is using things they know. Uh, another one, if we look at Hebrew 4, or, or Isaiah 42, verse 4, he will not grow faint, he will not be broken until he's established justice in the earth, and the coastlands will wait for his teachings. Now here's something interesting. This is from the, from the Greek. He will blaze forth and will not be broken until he brings justice upon the earth and the nations will hope in his name. See the shift there. It's not his teachings. It's him as a person. And here's my theory <laughs> of how this happened because this is the, the Greek. They wanted that a faithful translation of the Hebrew when they did this. Here's what happened. When Abraham got the, the, the covenant with God and the promise, here's God, remember three parts. God said... I will give you, you know, your, your descendants will be as many as the stars in the sky. You'll have a land of your own. And the whole world will be blessed through you. Natural assumption the people made was all these things that were written in the prophets about this, this uh, person coming was about the nation of Israel. That's, that was the natural assumption. The whole world's going to be blessed through them. The translators of the Septuagint wanted to make sure the people understood what when Isaiah was talking, he wasn't talking about a nation, he was talking about an individual. So all that so they stuck that in there. They changed a few little bit. They 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 clarified it to say that it's this individual. When this individual comes, that will be the hope of the nations. It's not us as a whole people, it's this one individual is coming. And Isaiah is clear about that, but the people misunderstood it because they were, they, well, they asked the wrong questions. And they misunderstood that. And so, so Isaiah wants to make sure they understand it that properly, that this is an individual. And the people who put Isaiah into the Greek, they really emphasize it here by, by doing it that way. When we read these passages, uh, to really understand, to answer this question, who will this one be? Who will be this this servant that, that pleases the Lord, uh, to understand that, we need to look at um, one word. Um, this, the key to understanding this prophecy is the Hebrew word mishpat. It's translated uh, justice or judgment or decision. 
there is no good word in English for mishpat. And it's never caught on in English. Nobody talks about the mishpat. Sounds like something in your kitchen you pull out for the holidays. Maybe it's a, it's a, maybe it's a Swedish thing for making delicacies. I don't know. But in Hebrew, that's how we translate mishpat. We've got to be able to identify what mishpat is. Because when this person comes, the servant comes, they will bring it. And, and in fact, when uh, I would just read a passage here that, that um, from, this is Isaiah 42. I, the Lord, have called you to demonstrate my righteousness. I will take you by the hand and guard you, and I will give you to my people Israel as a symbol of my covenant with them. And, number one, you will be a light to guide the nations. Number two, you will open the eyes of the blind. And number three, you will free the captives from prison, releasing those who sit in dark dungeons. When this servant comes and they bring the Lord's mishpat, this is what it will look like. And the people knew that. They knew what to look for. In fact, when John the Baptist was arrested, this is what it says, John the Baptist who was in prison heard about all the things the Messiah was doing. So he sent the disciple, his disciples to ask Jesus, are you the Messiah we have been expecting, or should we be looking for someone else? John the Baptist, whose whole job in life was to prepare the people for the coming Messiah, he wanted to make sure he got it right. He wanted to make sure he did his job right. So before he, he knows his, he does not have long left, left before he will be killed. He sends his disciples, are you the one? Are you it? I got to know for sure. I got to know I got it right. And this is Jesus' answer. Jesus told them, go back to John and tell him what you've heard and seen. The blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised to life, and the good news is being preached to the poor. And tell them, God blesses those who do not turn away because of me. He doesn't say yes or no. He says, you know the prophecies. You know what, what this Messiah is supposed to do. This is what I'm doing. You can judge for yourself. Am I the one or not? But I'll tell you, anyone who doesn't turn away because of me will be blessed by God. Anyone who's not offended by me will be blessed by God. Jesus doesn't need to say yes or no to John. He just says, you know Isaiah. You know what he says. You know what, what, what God's mishpat looks like. Look at what I'm doing. And rest assured, John, you didn't get it wrong. You got it right. And, and so we have to be able to, to recognize these things. This, this mishpat, it's like rain coming down on parched ground. <laughs> After this last summer, we all know what parched ground looks like. And we know what it's like when the rain comes and it fills the ground and the, and the grass turns green and the, the trees uh, perk up and come back to life and, and the flowers bloom. That's what it's like when God's mishpat comes. It's like thirsty ground absorbing rain. Um, and, and so when Jesus came and he brought God's mishpat, this is what it looked like. It looked the, the, the blind receiving their, their sight, the lame walking, the sick healed, the deaf could hear and the dead raised back to life. Uh, the, the people are comforted by hearing the good news. And, and so, when, in fact, when we look at Jesus, when we, when we see the miracles of Jesus, we are seeing the mishpat of God in action. And I said that we don't have a good word for that in English. It's most often translated justice. But the word justice has been so misused in our world that, that it just has really lost its meaning in so many ways. And, and, and so this is what Jesus says, though. This is what it is. And in fact, when, when we see Jesus in action, when we see him healing people, when we hear him teaching, really what that is, is a window. It's a window into a world that lives immersed in, in God's presence, in, in God's mishpat, as it's called here, God's justice and judgment. If, if Adam and Eve had never listened and had never eaten that fruit, that's what, the, that's what a world dominated by God's mishpat would look like. When, when we think of, when people ask me, what is heaven like? That's another question I get a lot. Uh, I say, look at Jesus doing the miracles. 
the results of those miracles, that's what heaven will look like. Because that's a world where God's justice reigns. That's a world where God's, where God's uh, decisions really dominate. And that's what it will be like. That's why John wrote in the book of Revelation that it's a place where every tear is wiped away and, and you know every illness is healed because God's mishpat is there. We're living in the midst of it when we see Christ there. That's why the, the people who put the, the Bible from the Hebrew to the, to the Greek wanted to make sure the people understood that, that this is an individual. This is not uh, us. It's not some teaching. There's someone who's coming who's bringing this, whose very presence is this. You want to hear more about that next week? <laughs> next week we'll, be, we'll talk more, more about that, that, that where Jesus is, that's where God's reign is. That's where God's mishpat is found. Um, and, and so this is our getting ready for Christmas here, this, the ending, this little series we had on these prophecies. This is where we end up that our only hope for God's mishpat, to live in, in God's presence, is through Jesus Christ. They like said the world has abused this word so much. And, and in the world now, really justice has, has become, uh, uh, it, it, they boil it down to like not offending people. And, and things like that. There's no healing in that. It's all superficial. There, there, there is no healing in, I'll, I'll say it, political correctness. There's no healing there. It's not a bad idea to be sensitive to other people's, uh, uh, you know, their sensibilities. It's not a bad idea to try and not offend people. But there's no healing in it. There's no eternity in it. Uh, the only place we find the eternity, the only place we find the healing is in Jesus Christ. And when he brings it to us, that's why uh, we are the ones, as the church, we're the only ones in the whole world who have been given the job of taking this message to the world. And if we don't say it, nobody else will because it's not their job. It's our job to go out into the world and say, this is what God's justice looks like. The lame walk, the deaf hear, uh, the sick are healed, the dead are raised to life. That's what it's like to live in God's presence. And that is what we are waiting in anticipation. When we sing the song, light one candle, waiting for Messiah, this is what we're waiting for. We're waiting for it to, to we get a glimpse of it when we read about, about Jesus healing people. We see through the window of those miracles into life in God's presence. And really, that's what we're celebrating at Christmas is the coming of, of God's mishpat, of, of this, this reign of God. So let us pray. Lord God, we give you thanks for Jesus that, that he brings your justice and judgment and decisions into our lives, that, that he is the one, when we look to him, we see you in action. And we pray, Lord, that, that that would inspire us, that we would be filled with, with, with your justice, with your mishpat, so that we would take that out into the world and other people would see you active in our lives and active through us so that we could be a blessing. And we give you thanks for that as we prepare now for, for Jesus' birth and celebrating that. And we pray in his name. Amen.